Hello everyone! Welcome to Episode 5 of A Grand Education and stories about the one-room schools in the county of Grand Prairie. <gasps> My heavens, Linda! You've changed! <gasps> I'm kidding. <laughs> Linda had to um, be at a family event this weekend and I'm happy to welcome Sue Farrell Haller to take her place for this episode and the next. Thanks Beth. I love hats and I'm happy to try on Linda's. We call this segment the Movable School. The focus is on the Kluskin and Bazanson areas east of Grand Prairie. So we'll talk about Lindsay, Fitzsimmons, East Kluskin and Bazanson schools. These are four of the five districts that join together to form the Bazanson Consolidated School. The government was working to build the peace country, filling its wide open spaces with eager settlers dreaming of free farmland and better lives for their families. Many of the changes we saw in these areas were because of promises of advancements in transportation, which led to speculation and increased population. The railway was coming north, and then it wasn't. But later it did. The ferry at the Smoky River was in one place, and then its route changed to for further east. The town, or hamlet of Bazanson was built in one place, and then it was moved 10 kilometers away from the river. The Bazanson School District was formed in 1913, when A.M. Bazanson's town was still taking shape. Transportation was on his mind, the ferry crossing on the Smoky, and more importantly, the proposed Canadian Northern Railway, which later became CN Rail. School began in Bazanson in 1916 in a church slightly up from the old town site. Wanda Johnson Zenner, a local historian and former student of Bazanson School, will tell us more. In 1913, A.M. Besanson had a town site surveyed on a plateau overlooking the junction of the Smoky and the Simonette Rivers, where survey stakes declared the proposed Canadian Northern Railway to enter the Peace Country. In 1915, a log Presbyterian church, 30 by 20 feet, was built slightly uphill from the town site, and that fall, the Bazanson School District, number 3302, was formed and named after the founder of the town site, Ansel Maynard Bazanson. Organizers decided that the church could serve as a schoolhouse during the week. Therefore, classes began in 1916 with Miss Ida Colby as the first teacher. At first, the district covered an area two miles on the east side of the Smoky and three miles on the west side with a ferry in between for transportation. After the population on the east side of the river dwindled and new settlers arrived to the west, the school district was changed and a new school site was chosen. On the southeast of 25, 71, three west of the six, just north of the old Bazanson to Grand Prairie Trail. In 1919, a 22 by 24 foot frame school on a concrete foundation was erected by the community labor under the direction of Holmes and Stewart building contractors. The school had two small attached entryways, one on each side of the building, and was finished with shiplap exterior, four inch fir flooring, and a shingled roof. Once again, in December of 1925, the school district was changed, and a site one mile northwest was chosen for the school. The move was contested and debated until parents simply took matters into their own hands, hooked up teams of horses, and moved that school when the board was still sequestered in yet another meeting to discuss the matter further. In 1926, work for a cement foundation to be built under the school and a barn 16 by 24 was put up for tender. A cistern was dug and cemented in 1931, which was a welcomed addition to the school site. The school was not only the educational center for the area, but was also the social gathering spot in the neighborhood. In 1930, parents at Besanson and the neighboring districts of East Kleskin, Somme, and Lindsay 
were eager to have a high school. They appealed to the chief inspector of schools in Edmonton, saying they were willing to make a voluntary contribution towards the cost of maintaining and operating a classroom for high school students. The inspector supported them and soon high school classes for grades 9, 10, and 11, which even include Latin, if you can imagine, were being taught in the existing Byzantine Log Hall. Unfortunately, the high school only operated for the 1930-31 school term with Dorothy Goodland as teacher. Teachers for small country schools were becoming increasingly difficult to find. And in 1950-51, children at the Bazanza School District number 3302 were reduced to correspondence lessons under supervision. At a school meeting in 1951, the parents were asked to vote on a motion to have a van route to take the children to the Lindsay School, but it was defeated 10 to 6. However, parents who were not at that meeting signed a petition to reverse that decision and the motion was eventually passed. At the end of June 1951, the Bazantson School closed and the building was sold to Ross Ford to become his residence in the hamlet of Bazantson, where unfortunately it burned down a few years later. Settlers in the Lindsay area first met to plan a school in the summer of 1920. The school opened a year later with about 30 students. Named after pioneer George Lindsay, the school was located northwest of the original Byzantine town site. Lindsay School laid further proof of the importance of education to the area. By 1933, high school enrollment had blossomed and Lindsay School required a second room with a second teacher. Despite traveling by a team of horses knee deep in mud, coming down with typhoid and running into all sorts of disasters, large and small, Grace Dobson Wilson said teaching at Lindsay School during the 1933 to 1934 school term was one of the best years of her life. Mary Helen Hopkins, with her usual vibrancy, will share some of Grace's recollections that appear in the local history book, Smoky River to Grand Prairie. What a trip! Mary made contact with me by wearing a flower on her coat, as in great adventures and romances. The galloping goose, as we called the NAR, puffed out of Edmonton, jammed full. Few people got any rest during the next 20 hours. Mr. Rooney, or was it Mr. R. Ames, a member of the school board, met us and the horses plodded 25 miles or so to our new abode in a tiny teacherage. A real honest to goodness doll's house. Two rooms with barely room for two cots, a heater, a stove, a table, and two chairs and apple box cupboards. We hung clothes on nails along the walls. Oh yes and kept an unloaded shotgun behind the door to scare off anyone we didn't want to come calling. There were moonshiners not too far away, and we sometimes looked up from our work to see faces peering in the window at us. There have been a lot of changes in teaching methods and teaching tools since the 1930s, but the best teachers then and now are known to be very resourceful. Anything can happen in a classroom of students and anything can be turned into a teachable moment. Here's Mary Helen again. Well, do I remember the day I came into the school after recess to find grasshoppers in my desk drawers, grasshoppers under the handbell, grasshoppers everywhere. So, of course, we immediately studied these insects. There were more than enough to go around. We noticed how they spit tobacco, how they jumped, how they made such a funny sound with their legs. The grand finale was to see whose grasshopper could jump the farthest. The winning grasshopper jumped down the back of a girl's dress what a riot! 
a garter snake was brought in for inspection, but created no furor with the teacher, for I liked them. We had an easy lesson with that one. One afternoon, a boy lugged in a benumbed groundhog, which he had knocked over the head. The lesson went well till the poor creature blinked an eye as he began to revive, as I held him by the tail. That caused a sudden ending to our observation. The winter weather was something to contend with. The temperature often sank from 30 to 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and water in tubs and pitchers indoors froze solid. This must have been before the invention of insulation for walls. I got slop hoppy one day after four o'clock and threw eggs, oranges, and potatoes on the floor and at the walls with nary a crack nor a splash resulting. We got water from a well by dropping a pail on the end of a rope. In winter, it froze quite stiff and we had to break the ice with rocks. We also split our own wood from poplar trees supplied to us by the school board. It was a good thing I had learned to saw and chop trees with my dad. Just after Halloween was my biggest calamity. I fainted in snowdrifts. I fainted in the school and I fainted in the teacherage. Finally, I was persuaded to go see Dr. O'Brien in Grand Prairie. He feared I had typhoid fever. So I was admitted to the Memorial Hospital and was in quarantine from everyone until I had three negative tests from Edmonton. Later, the Alberta Health Board declared there had been typhoid germs dormant in the walls of the former log house in which I was teaching. We had to stoke the heater so hard that I guess we thawed them into activity and they visited me in particular. The Balfours and nurses were good to me while I was in quarantine. Mary wrote to me and to my parents as well to calm their fears, but the hospital garnished my wages for $200. What a blow! Now remember, this was the Great Depression. $200 was a huge amount of money for a school teacher who made only $600 for the year. North of Lindsay School was the Fitzsimmons School District. It was formed in 1930 when the school age population of the district continued to grow. Fitzsimmons School was built to relieve the pressure on Lindsay School. There were simply too many students for one school to handle. The new school was also named after a homesteader, Scotty Fitzsimmons. Jack Laverick attended Fitzsimmons School before being bused to Byzantine School. Let's listen to our reader, Hilda Fisher, tell about Jack's school days. Jack Laverick attended Fitzsimmons School from the fall of 1951 until June 1956 for grades 1 to grade 5. Most years, he was the only one in his grade. There were only 6 to 10 students in the whole school, so that wasn't uncommon. He had supervisors for grades 1 and 2, Miss Alma Tanchuk in 1951-52 for grade 1, and Miss Elsie Braun in 1952-53 for grade 2. The last three years that Fitzsimmons was open, when Jack was in grades 3 to 5, Margaret White taught at the school. Jack remembers her fondly as an excellent teacher. Margaret lived across the road from the school with her husband in a small house that was located on her parents' farm. Jack's regular chore was to fetch pails of water from the well on the farm to fill up the water cooler at the back of the classroom. He also brought over armloads of wood for the stove. The Lavericks lived about two miles from the school and Jack rode his horse to school every day. When the horse spied the barn ahead, it became so excited that it would make a run for the entrance and try to scrape Jack off against the top of the low door in the process. Jack recalls Fitzsimmons as having a great social atmosphere with many community events, including the school picnic, community concerts, and box socials. When the school closed in, in June 1956, Jack and his classmates were bused to Byzantine Consolidated School in the hamlet of Byzantine 
for the 1956-1957 year. Many of the children in his new class had been together since grade one, so deep friendships had already been made. Jack admitted that it took time to adjust to his new environment of a larger school with a whole class of students his own age. When he completed grade nine at Besanson, Jack attended St. Joe's Catholic High School in Grand Prairie for four years. By the early 1950s, the school boards were talking about consolidation. The idea was to amalgamate five school districts, Psalm, Besanson, Lindsay, Fitzsimmons, and East Kleskin. They consolidated under the name Lindsay School District. It was later changed to the Besanson School District. We have Wanda Zenner back to tell us how that affected Besanson School. The influx of students from the neighboring school districts, there was now a need for a larger school, thus a four-room school known as the Besanson Consolidated School was built directly behind the location of the two Lindsay School buildings. In fact, there were so many students registered for the 1956-57 school term that the Besanson Legion Hut was rented for use as an overflow classroom. The new Besanson Consolidated School opened in September of 1957 and was known to have exceptional features not characteristic of schools a generation ago. Four classrooms, a science room, principal's office, lighting, and even the wonder of indoor plumbing. In 1960, an addition was built to the school that included a gymnasium, one classroom, a library, staff lounge, and an administrative office. The school is still the heart and the soul of the Bishatson community, just as it was in 1916, when the first students were welcomed into the halls of learning. Not to be forgotten was East Kleskin School. We have an interview with Gail Mellum, who attended East Kleskin from 1948 to 1957. In her piece, she mentions a new grade one student who couldn't speak English when she first arrived at school. The student was Christine Pinch Fester. In addition to Gail's fond memories of helping to teach this young student to speak English, we have recollections of Christine herself. How cool is that? The reason I got to go to school when I was five, my dad, he talked, had to talk to the uh, supervisor at the schools for the, of the school system because I spoke no English or very little English. At the time, they, there was some kind of a stipulation that you were supposed to be uh, six by the time September 1st rolled around. And because of my uh, next to no English, it was, they felt that it was going to be too difficult for me. My dad finally uh, convinced the supervisor that I needed to go to school to learn English. The older children quite often helped with the younger children, like myself. One of the older girls, her name is Gail, she, and a few of the other older girls. They were trying to teach me how to speak English. We had the, the lovely old reader's book of Dick and Jane, and we would say, see uh, Dick run, or the dog Spot run, and then we would run and we'd get her to say run. Then we would get her to say sit, and uh, we would sit. We always had fun with that because she, of course, would speak her language until we got her to, to speak our language. And uh, it, it really worked on her. She learned quickly. She had, she had three or four of us at her, so. <laughs> and that was a fun time. I'm sure the teacher appreciated that too. So I got the idea of what they were trying to teach me. That worked out really well, but one day, my classmate got sent to the corner. I decided that I had to do everything that my classmate did. So I went to the corner as well with her. Of course, the class burst out laughing and my poor teacher, he could not get control of the class. So he declared a recess. All my classmates thought that was pretty cool that this little girl could get the class disrupted and they could have a spare recess. 
And that brings us to the warm and cozy end of today's program. You would not believe the vintage hats that we will be wearing for episode six when we talk about what happened at Twilight, Five Mile Creek, and Crystal Creek schools. Maybe we should call that one the Creaky episode. Oh, <laughs> good idea. <laughs> We acknowledge that we live and film on Treaty 8 territory, the ancestral and present day home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. We are grateful to work, live and learn on the traditional territory of Duncan First Nation, Horse Lake First Nation and Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation who are the original caretakers of this land. We acknowledge the history of this land and we are thankful for the opportunity to walk together in friendship where we will encourage and promote positive change for present and future generations. That is a very special and meaningful statement for us and for our project.